Give me a cue. Yes, please. So good evening, colleagues uh, and friends, depending on where you are, or good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this uh, talk under the ages of uh, Center for Studies, Center for Researchers in Emerging Economies, which is dedicated to um, promoting quality, path-breaking research and bringing researchers and industry leaders together. Um, the title of today's talk is Intermediary Good Pricing in Production Networks, Equality and Inequality in a Theory of Value. And uh, the speaker for today is uh, Professor Rob Giles. To tell you a bit about uh, uh, today's talk, Professor Giles conceptualizes an economy as uh, a social division of labor or a production regime uh, uh, carried out through a social division of labor. Uh, and in the midst of that, he tries to visualize the role of intermediary commodities. Now, moving on, let me tell you a bit about Professor Rob Giles. He teaches at Queen's University, Belfast. He is a primarily a theoretical economist and has uh, earned his PhD from uh, Tilburg University in the Netherlands. He has been a mathematical economic he has been a lecturer of mathematical economics at Tilburg University prior to joining the Department of Economics at Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, which is in the United States of America. And uh, he has been teaching at uh, uh, Queen's University Belfast uh, since 2009. Uh, before I hand over the floor to you, Professor Giles, a um, few instructions for uh, our, our guests today, our friends today. In case if uh, you have any questions, please type those in the, in the chat box at the end of the talk, Professor Giles uh, shall uh, take them up one by one and kindly keep your mics and uh, cameras switched off for the duration of the talk. Over to you, Professor Giles. All right, thank you. Thank you for in, uh, inviting me and to, uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here and talk about this uh, ongoing research project really. So um, I uh, stumbled into this when I was still in the United States and, and some people visited from, uh, from Monash University in Australia. Uh, uh, Chao Kai Yang uh, was working on this idea of Adam Smith that, um, that economic wealth is created through a social division of labor. And um, he introduced a mathematical theory to describe that. And I built on that. And now I realize that it brings really a lot of things together, a lot of ideas and a lot of questions also, a lot of questions that still cannot be answered, by the way. And these ideas are um, relating very much to the contemporary economy and the environment, the, um, all the ongoing problems. And the idea that um, the global economy is guided through uh, supply chains, which you can see as part of this social division of labor. So I, um, I base myself on um, the presentation today on a two volume book that I wrote on the social division of labor. So in volume one is, is an institutional perspective on the social division of labor. It's, it's very conceptual and um, I talk about um, many aspects of the social division of labor when you, you think about it, what the results are uh, with regard to understanding the economy. And in the second part, I develop a more mathematical theory of how the social division of labor functions based on this Jungian approach, um, which had some issues that I was able to resolve. And at the end of this volume, I'm talking about um, representing the, the framework through a network approach. And I, I call that production networks. So production networks, when I use that term, I'm referring really to a network representation of the social division of labor. And like I said, a lot of ideas from, from economics throughout history of economics come together into this, it is not just market theory that, that is related to this, but there's also the theory of uh, production, and in particular, that of the classical political economists, but also of uh, Leontjev and Shrafa. There's a direct relationship to the, the Leontjev model, uh, input-output model, and there's a direct relationship also as a consequence 
to Shrafa's ideas. And um, as a consequence, um, it, it fits in this, this, this kind of um, framework very well. All of these ideas come together. So I will talk, I will introduce first the subject, then I will talk about uh, a benchmark which was fully developed and which, uh, which, which clarifies a lot, I think. And then I will talk about um, the idea of production networks and how it all relates to social division of labor. And uh, I will, I've chosen not to be too mathematical. There's a little bit of mathematics in there, but uh, relatively minor. I just summarize results. I have a few definitions that I have to go through, but to give a better idea of what certain things mean. But I have restricted myself to a relatively um, non-mathematical presentation. So the basic idea is that economic wealth is created through a social division of labor. And um, um, the social division of labor, uh, this, this idea originates already with Plato when he talks about the polis in his uh, dialogue, uh, Republic. Uh, Republic is about uh, good governance in a polis. And part of it is uh, describing what actually happens in, in a polis and how economic wealth is created. And this uh, is very much centered on this social division of labor. And um, this was picked up by the classical political economists in the 19th century and has since then been relatively abandoned until Shao Kai Yang in the 1990s uh, revived this idea and tried to build an, a market theory of the social division of labor uh, around this. Yeah. Anyway, the idea is that instead of having autarkic production, you, you externalize the production into a trade infrastructure. And you do that through the trade of commodities that are produced in production processes. And that you, um, as a consequence, you, you allocate as well as create value. So uh, wealth is created in the production processes that are described in the social division of labor. But also the allocation happens through the social division of labor. And this is all guided by what I call an architecture. It is, a, it is the, the, the bare bone structure of the um, production system. It is the commodities, it's the professions, and it are the trade institutions. And all of these things come together. So there are three fundamental uh, ideas that make the social division of labor work. And those ideas, are founded in human ability and that humans have recognized that they have these abilities from very early on. Um, so it, it, when you read a bit of anthropology, it is clear that um, humans, when, when Homo sapiens arose, it was already that they were able to create this economic wealth through a social division of labor, although it was not, of course, fully externalized. It was much more collective in a tribe, but still there was a rudimentary uh, social division of labor at work there. And the, the three forces, so to say, that make this possible is first of all, what I call increasing returns to specialization. The idea that when we do things sufficiently many times, we become better at it. We are learning and we are, um, uh, creating more wealth by becoming more proficient uh, at something. This is a weaker property than increasing returns to scale, but it is a complete negation of a decreasing returns to scale. Uh, so market theory is very much based on decreasing returns to scale. That does not fit with this idea of the social division of labor uh, in this particular uh, aspect. The second is that the recognition that if you have specialized individuals that are then uh, produ producing at a high level of efficiency, um, that there is this idea of trade that you, that you rely on each other to produce multiple commodities um, 
in a specialized way, but then you can trade with each other to make uh, to to allow mixed consumption of these uh, commodities, and this is called consumptive smoothing, and this corresponds to convexity of the preferences uh, in the economy. And a recent also uh, research in um, theoretical economics, particular Ariel Rubinstein. Uh, recently developed a number of papers in which he showed that convexity is an extremely important property to make the economy work and to get an equilibrium essentially. And I found that in the same way. It, we, we need this convexity, even though a lot of work has been done in the past to, to get away from convexity um, in the theory of markets in particular. Uh, but I think it fits extremely naturally together with this increasing terms of specialization. Now, this has to be brought together, and that is done through uh, what I call a trade infrastructure, and that is based on behavioral norms, institutions, conventions, markets, market structures. And uh, what we will do is describe that in a particular way through networks as well in this. Uh, for, for this purpose. All right, um, so um, I have to dwell a little bit on goods and commodities because I think the, the whole issue of the theory is very much based on this uh, con uh, conceptual issue of commodities. Namely, in economics, commodities are made extremely simplistic Commodities are always labels of, of something desirable. Uh, it, it features in utility functions, for example, and it features also in production functions. But uh, in reality, of course, a lot of commodities are not desirable at all in an, in a, from a consumptive point of view. They're desirable from a productive point of view only. So I want to distinguish that from the very beginning. And so, what is common to all economic goods is that they have use value. They are useful in the production of um, economic wealth, so to say. And we can distinguish therefore two types of goods, two fundamental types, namely consumption goods, which are directly contributing to that use value. You, you, it is used in consumption and consumption processes are essentially the accessing of this use value. However, a lot of commodities are not directly um, used in consumption processes, um, but are used in production processes to create consumption goods. And so they're intermediary goods that are indirect, uh, that have indirect use value and are only featured in production processes. Now, economic goods that are admitted to this trade infrastructure and that are collectively or socially recognized as tradable um, can be called commodities. So I distinguish goods from commodities in the sense that goods can be anything really, but commodities are the ones that are traded. And those feature in the theory. So a lot of goods can be used in the production processes in particular, but can be non-tradable. So historically, for example, uh, labor was non-tradable in a pre-capitalist economy. And um, they were still, labor is an intermediary good, but if it is not tradable, then it is not necessarily a commodity. And it does not have an exchange value or a price, as we can call that. So, um, the next is that if we have then a social division of labor based on these principles that I set out, and it is about commodities, um, there are two fundamental logics to understand this social division of labor. And the dominant one is what can be called the Ricardian logic. Um, I, um, this is taken from a paper by uh, Buchanan who, who discussed uh, Adam Smith and the idea of the social division of labor. Um, and he set out those two fundamental logics. And the Ricardian logic is, um, is founded on the idea that productive abilities 
are based on individual ability. It is based on talent. And so this leads naturally to this idea of comparative advantages, for example, and the seeking of an optimal way to produce. So you, you, you adapt your specialization in response to what happens in the economy, in particular, in response to the prices that are certain commodities command in, in markets. And so you get comparative advantages, you, you're comparatively um, suited for produ producing a certain commodity, and you will do that. Yeah. Now, the Smithian logic is, is very different. Adam Smith did not think about the social division labor from this perspective at all. He thought about it more from a social perspective and from um, a collective understanding of productivity and productive abilities. So individual productive abilities are not individual at all, they're social. And so we have professions and you have a system of education in which you're trained and you're trained based on a common knowledge or a historical knowledge that was built up over time uh, to, to, to define a certain profession. So when you become a baker, you learn that in some educational system because maybe you become an apprentice uh, with a master baker and you learn to bake bread and you learn to do that to a certain specification, a certain standard. And you, um, uh, that is uh, leading then to a different type of specialization, namely you specialize by choosing a certain profession and you learn it to a certain specification that is collectively determined, that is historically determined. And so you are approximately equally productive. So when you're a trained baker, you're approximately as productive as the other bakers in the profession. And this is rather different. It is not about comparative advantages. It is about choosing a profession and, and um, learning that profession to a certain level of proficiency. Then um, I want to say a few words about commodities um, because I distinguish then these uh, consumption goods from intermediary goods. Um, there are some very important uh, uh, issues uh, related to this and those are based on on three main uh, sets, strands of thought about commodities. Commodities are under, under discussed in economics, I think. Uh, nobody is really thinking about it, just throw in a bunch of commodities and we go ahead and we do something. Um, and the three threans, uh, th uh, strands of thought are um, the Marxian ideas, and then uh, Leontjev and Schraffa, and then De Breu. All of them have major contributions on the idea of commodity and uh, influenced tremendously the development of, the, of economics, economic theory in particular. So Marx um, set out his idea of, um, of, of a capitalist economy, of course, in his uh, work uh, Capital, and there you see that in chapter one, in volume one, he starts out with the, developing the idea of a commodity. And that me, that is because this is the most fundamental, most um, difficult and, and also problematic area uh, for, uh, for understanding uh, the economy. And um, he attaches everything essentially, his whole theory is based on his ideas about commodities. And he distinguishes three certain uh, values that can be attached to a commodity. So I talked already about use value, uh, the, the use of it in, in for doing certain things, and the exchange value, the value that it commands in the market. And then something what he wants to call value, which is the labor value, which is different from the exchange value and also different from the use value for him. I don't want to dwell on labor value very much. I want to focus more on the use value and exchange value. Um, it is very clear that Marx thinks of commodities as very physical things. 
services and all these kind of things that are so important for our contemporary economy are not seen by him as commodities. And commodities are also subject to demand and supply. They, they, they are consumption goods, what I call consumption goods. Uh, the, the idea of having intermediary goods is not well developed in markets, uh, in, in Marx at all. And um, as such, it, it, the, the whole framework remains uh, problematic for applying to our contemporary economy, in my opinion. Um, anyway, the, um, the main idea is that in different instances, the commodity can have different uh, effects. And he calls that forms. So there is a, a use form and a value form, which is related to this use value and the exchange value. So the value form is the one that is traded in the market system, let's say. And this is subject to this idea of um, accumulation, capital accumulation in the capitalist economy. So commodities play an important role to accumulate uh, value. Um, and this is very different from the use form of the commodity. So that idea, I will pick that up because I will do something uh, relatively similar uh, in my model. Yeah. Um, the second idea is from Leon Zeffen Schraffa. Here also, again, commodities are uh, subject to demand and supply, but both of these thinkers really focus on the production side of everything to the supply side of everything. So they have a production system approach to uh, the economy. And um, um, Schraffa in particular distinguishes commodities in a different way than Marx does, namely some commodities are priced through scarcity, which is in his case, Leontjev pricing, by the way, it is not market pricing. And some are subject to a relational valuation. So contracts between uh, parties that are related in the production system. And this is mainly labor. So labor forms a very separate category in Shrafa. But this can be extended to arbitrary intermediary inputs. And that is the idea that I will pursue. So the idea that I will pursue is that consumption goods, consumption commodities, are always determined, the price of them is always determined through scarcity, but the intermediary goods, they're priced through uh, relationships in the production system because they're not subject to demand. They're only subject to the productive side. And that is a technology that is an input output uh, determination. Finally, De Bruy introduced the idea of a contingent commodity concept. So the commodity is completely determined by a state in which it is used. This is a state-based concept. And so it is based on location, time, usage, and rules. And then under the, the, the idea of uh, a general equilibrium as defined by De Bruy, you get infinitely many thin markets as a consequence. And there's a real problem with the whole theory as a consequence as well. And that has led to incomplete market theory. And yeah, I don't want to dwell on this too much. Yeah. So what I will do in my theory is I will distinguish consumption goods from intermediary inputs. And I, I have L sub C consumption goods and L sub P intermediary goods from the beginning. And I will, um, I point out that some things are not part of this uh, whole theory yet, namely in particular uh, services, which is very important for the contemporary economy, and also collective goods. Uh, I, we have a collective good uh, theory for perfect com the, the, the case of perfect competition, but not for the production network. Yeah. The whole theory is based on the idea of consumer producers. So this, this idea was introduced by Young in his dissertation in 1988, and further developed in two uh, books, 2001 and 2003. 
And a consumer producer, you, you do not have a dichotomy between consumers and producers. Everybody is a consumer and a producer at the same time. And firms are built from these consumer producers. Everybody is uh, playing a role in the, in the social division of labor. And when you have larger entities, social production organizations, then you, you have to pinpoint these building blocks. And these building blocks are consumer producers. Um, on the consumption side, we assume the standard properties, um, in, including monotonicity and this consumptive smoothing, this convexity. And on the production side, I have the standard assumptions and then the increasing returns to specialization. And the increasing returns to specialization is that uh, we identify corner points to the production set. So the most optimal way in which to produce is in, represented in a corner point. And the corner point indeed stands out in the production set. And it is better to, to just show a picture of that. Here we have a two dimensional uh, case, the two goods. And you see here, we have two corner points and the corner points stand out in the, in the, uh, from, from the rest of the production set in the sense that um, the production set is captured in the comprehensive hull of the convex hull of these corner points. That is the red line and everything is falls below the red line. That is really what I mean here. I have uh, another example here. Here we see that the production set um, can intersect with, um, with that red line. Uh, there can be more points on that. These are also suboptimal in some sense uh, because you can go further out. You can go to this Z1 and Z2. You don't have to stick to those uh, corner points. So uh, this is called weekly increasing return specialization. And when there are no other intersection points with, uh, with this convex hull, then we can call it the strong uh, in, uh, increasing returns to specialization. So I want to summarize the classical benchmark, namely perfect competition. And there's a number of assumptions that are made that simplify the whole thing because uh, we get for the benchmark, everything has to be simplified to consumption goods only because everything has to be subject to demand and supply. And we impose the law of one price on that. And um, I also want to point out that this uh, brings together the Ricardian and the Smithian logic. Uh, the Smithian logic is a special case of the Ricardian logic in this framework, because you can say these production sets are based on individual ability, like uh, the Ricardian logic, or you can say all these uh, uh, consumer producers have the same corner points in particular, because there is a social production knowledge in the background on which they base their productive abilities. And that is the Smithian logic. Yeah. So we can see that as a special case of this Ricardian logic. So in this world, we define then an equilibrium and uh, this equilibrium based on selecting production and consumption plans by all these economic agents, all these consumer producers. And um, um, we assume there is a frictionless world as usual. That means there are no costs of making these decisions or changing these decisions. And so we can summarize that every agent selects uh, a pair, an F and a G. The G is a production plan in the production set. And an F is a, a consumption plan or consumption bundle that is in the uh, budget set uh, based on the market prices. So P here is uh, the market prices in the standard way. Now in this world, we get immediately a dichotomy of decisions. So here you see immediately that consumption and 
production are separated by the price mechanism. So production decisions are completely based on income maximization and consumption decisions are based on uh, optimization of the preferences subject to the budget constraint. So you get your classical world back and this comes from simply from imposing the price mechanism in this world where you have only consumption goods. Moreover, if we assume increasing return specialization as we did, um, all production will be specialized and there will be, they will be specialized in the production of a single output. And um, there results also a non-trivial economy, namely there is always a surplus uh, in that economy as a result from this uh, from this uh, increasing return specialization. Now, if we then apply the Smithian logic and, and we, we give all economic agents access to an education system and the ability to specialize in a profession and the profession is based on, uh, is, is, is represented by these uh, production plans that correspond to this uh, knowledge, the common knowledge, then what we get is that the market equilibrium prices all become completely equal to the Leontjev prices uh, based on the input output matrix based on these professions. So you get an, an um, you have L professions, namely for each uh, commodity, you have a profession and you can write down these uh, production plans in the form of a matrix. And based on this matrix, you can compute the Leontjev prices. And those are exactly the market prices. Now the equilibrium is established by the endogenous modification of the social division of labor uh, to meet demand at the prices, at these Leontjev prices. And so you get a reversed equilibration uh, process. You, you do not have equilibration uh, through the price mechanism, but through the adaptation of the social division of labor, through the supply side, essentially. Now note the Leontjev prices are really a mathematical form of labor values, labor values in the sense of uh, the, the classical political economists of the 19th century. And um, so, in this ideal world of perfect, a perfectly competitive uh, economy with the social division of labor based on professions and a social knowledge of production, um, the market prices are equal to the labor values of these commodities. And that is, uh, was to me a very surprising insight, uh, but in retrospect, it makes a lot of sense when you understand the mechanism uh, it makes a lot of sense. But this, this, uh, this refers, of course, to this ancient dispute about labor value theory versus uh, market value theory. Um, there is no conflict here in this kind of world. That is what it means. Okay, so let's now move on to these uh, production networks. And I realize I, I am uh, spending a bit too much time. Um, but um, there are two issues, namely uh, perfect competition is an ideal state. And of course, there are always adaptation costs. You cannot assume that all the way. And as such, we have a much more sticky production system um, and uh, perfect competition is therefore uh, not possible. Moreover, the perfectly competitive framework that I set up, because everything has to be subject to demand and supply, what do you do with these intermediary goods? Uh, what, what You can of course assume that there's always a zero demand for intermediary goods, and then you can solve the model and that is all fine, but it does not really resolve the special issue of intermediary goods. If we um, think a bit deeper about it, then if you apply the, the Smithian logic, if you stick to the Smithian logic, you very, in a very natural way come to a uh, Shravian perspective, namely producing commodities through 
the use of other commodities. And that leads then to this idea of a production network. And that is the idea that is captured in this little picture. Here you see what is required to make a pencil. Um, and uh, we have many, many of these uh, intermediary products and they come from all over the world uh, in our global economy. And many of those, uh, there is no use for it in consumption directly. If you have uh, these, these inputs there, like graphite, um, there is very little use for in your, in your daily life for consuming graphite, so to say. You will use it in a certain form, namely as, as an intermediary product in the production of another good. And in this particular case, uh, a pencil. So this in a very natural way, if you, if you combine that with these uh, ideas that I set out before, namely that you're these consumer producers and you, they specialize fully in the production of a single output, many of these consumer producers should be producing these intermediary goods. And that is, uh, what is what is at the foundation of this idea of a production network. So what we do is just translate this picture that I just showed you of the pencil into a network. It is actually a network when you think of it, but namely uh, it, it depicts there the intermediary goods, but somebody has to produce those. And so you can easily relate it to a producer of that particular good and place them in that network. And that network then is a representation of a production system. It is in particular a representation of a Shroffian production system in that regard, yeah. And we need a value theory that that is that is uh, dealing with intermediary goods as well as consumption goods. So, technically speaking, a production network consists of positions and links, and the trade flows are linked to the link. So, when there is an an arrow, so to say, from one position to another it describes a flow of goods. In particular, it, it describes one particular flow of goods, namely that one particular intermediary good that we are talking about that is produced by that uh, producer, consumer producer that is uh, assigned to this one position. And that is then um, the idea that each position is assigned to, uh, to a full specialization production plan essentially. And so um, all trade that flows in and out of that position needs to add up to this assigned production plan. So we have a very strict production technological constraint on the whole thing. There's very little flexibility. If we produce a certain number of pencils, we need a certain amount of graphite to produce that. And if you produce too much, you have surplus at that particular position and it's a waste of, of production essentially. If you produce too little, there's a problem as well. So this was the idea of Schwaffa, that you have this kind of straight jacket production system. Uh, and that is, that is what we represent in those production networks. So it's very different from the perfectly competitive world. Here I, take out one particular positions, uh, uh, I call him uh, one. So this is position one. Position one, one uses two particular inputs, namely a red input and a green input and produces then one output. Um, and the input uh, is provided by uh, three other positions, three other consumer producers, so to say. The alpha and beta, they are producing uh, commodity uh, one, intermediary commodity one, that is traded in certain quantities, A and B, to one, uh, position one. And gamma produces the second input, uh, commodity two, intermediary good number two, and trades a certain quantity C to one. And with those inputs, one produces D units of a certain output. And this output could be 
an intermediary good, but it could also be an, um, a final consumption good. Yeah. Anyway, we can describe then, we can represent this whole production system by full specialization production plans. So uh, Z of alpha is A00 and Z beta is B00. Now, if you assume a Smithian world, then A is equal to B. Yeah. Um, and, and gamma, we have zero, C zero is the production plan attached to that. And they come together in position, position one, and that position has also a full specialization production plan. And there are two inputs, and they're, they're described by negative entries in that production plan, negative A plus B and negative C, and then an output of commodity three, which is D units of commodity three. If we add them all up, you see that it describes exactly the output of the system that is the, the represented by this network. Yeah. We can build a matrix from this, and that is then the Lyonchev representation of this particular uh, production situation. Um, and um, you can then uh, compute the Lyonchev prices with this. This is all a legitimate exercise that you can do here. Let's uh, build a more, slightly more complex uh, production situation. We have two positions producing uh, final consumption goods, uh, X and Y, and they do that in a certain quantity, X and Y. We can then see where they're coming from. Y can be used as an intermediary input for the production of X as well. Uh, maybe production of X also requires another input. And those are then produced with inputs from other entities. Um, and we, we know I, you stick here explicitly to the Smithian logic. And so the names that I give to these positions, those are the professions. So profession F is one particular profession. And that profession, um, it is described by a certain productive ability, and that certain productive ability is, is represented here uh, uh, in the quantities that, that, it, that, are the, uh, that are produced. And so we assign these quantities to those links. So you see here that F produces two units of output, and but the network describes how it is distributed in the production network, in the production process. Yeah, so I summarize here what I did. Let me skip that because I'm, I'm really running out of time. What we can do is we can build all kinds of rather complex production networks in this way. Here's an example, simplified example still, of um, incorporated production. So in particular, B and C are uh, incorporated uh, uh, firms and uh, B uh, are human capital uh, providers that are hired by uh, this is B, so uh, uh, capital B. And S are the human capital suppliers for C. Yeah. So you see here this, this uh, production network really describes a, a capitalist uh, system in that regard. You can also describe platforms. Uh, here's a matching market that you can describe in that way uh, as a network, as an element in the production network, I have to say. And you, it, uh, it is part, therefore, of a more comprehensive view. It is, we do not focus only on the matching, but also on the surroundings, essentially, of that. Okay, so... This is a formal representation of a production network. Production network consists of a number of positions, a number of professions, an assignment of professions to positions, and an assignment of trade flows to the links, and then an output function, essentially, um, that assigns to every position, a possibly a surplus that is generated at that position for final consumption. A lot of these positions might have zero um, output. Um, 
we use uh, we have two constraints for every position, namely all the uh, outflows need to add up to the output that corresponds to the profes uh, profession. So uh, Q, capital Q, is the output that corresponds to that. And all the outflows have to add up to that. And then all the inflows to a position need to add up to the required inputs for the produ production of this quantity QA. Yeah? So that is a description of the profession. And these are technical, production technical uh, restrictions that are then imposed. And then the total surplus that is generated from the network can be expressed as a uh, sum of uh, based on the on the row function, and that can also be expressed through the uh, uh, counting of the inputs and the outputs essentially. Yeah? So the outputs minus all the inputs uh, leads to the same thing. Okay, now we come to the, the main message here, and that is intermediate good pricing. What is now an equilibrium in this framework? The only thing that we know is that consumption goods um, should be priced based on balancing in the, in the markets. So demand and supply balance in markets, and that leads to a certain price. However, when we talk about the intermediary good, the demand and supply is purely technical in this framework. And so we need to use Shrafa's idea that you uh, have an, a pricing of that good that is technical as well. And that opens the door to uh, multiple possibilities. And that is what we will see. Yeah. Um, so, um, um, this is summarized then in three conditions for equilibrium. Namely, the production network has to be viable. That means all incomes generated at all positions in the network need to be non-negative. All markets are balanced for consumption goods and all economic agents, consumer producers, optimize their um, demand based on their preferences, based on the income that is generated at that position. And that leads then to market demand, uh, as we can see. Now, let's go back to the example. What I will do is uh, assign utility functions to all these uh, producers uh, and make the, uh, based on two goods only, X and Y. And what we then do is, um, uh, optimize those utility functions given the income. And here's an expression of that income. P is the price of Y in terms of X. Q is the price of the F output. That's intermediary good number one, so to say, based on, uh, in, in terms of X, X is the numeraire good. And R is the price of the M output, the second intermediary good, also in terms of X. And then you can have those expressions for income. Now, all these incomes uh, lead to consumption, uh, to, to, uh, are used for consumption, they lead to consumptive demand, and then you get uh, demand is equal to supply, and that determines then the prices for X and Y, essentially. Let's go back to the example. Uh, I will skip these slides. Here are those incomes. They all have to be non-negative. So this determines our price space essentially. And that corresponds to a certain uh, polytope in this case. Uh, you see here that uh, R is, a, is, is a, I take R out of the picture. I make a two dimensional picture of it between Q and P. Uh, but you see here the area in which uh, the prices have to be. And R is related also to P and Q. Uh, so for every P and Q that is in that uh, colored area, we have a certain range for which R, uh, uh, that, that R can have. Now, what does the market do? The market gives you an additional condition. Uh, if I apply, for example, Cobb-Douglas utility functions, I get a linear uh, condition. 
I get an equation in a P, Q, and R uh, that describes uh, the market balance uh, in, in the market system. And we can impose then that condition uh, in, the, in the setting. And you see then that you get an additional line. And then we see that if you combine that, you get um, the viable price systems combined with the uh, balanced uh, markets condition, you get a certain set of equilibria that emerge in this economy. And as you can see, there are many equilibria. Uh, essentially uh, Shrafa's uh, production system. And he was able to uh, define an equilibrium which he called, he called uh, imperfectly competitive equilibrium. Um, and this is very nicely applicable here. Namely, in a production network, you can impose uh, structures, additional structures. You can namely impose reference structures. And with reference, I mean positions that are similar in nature, similar in power, similar in, um, in treatment. And so you can think of uh, reference groups as groups of positions that are balanced, that are equalized in that regard. And so there's a correspondence between those positions and a competitive force, so to say, that forces those incomes to equalize over those positions. Now, monopoly power, or the equivalence of, of monopoly power, can then be represented by a singleton reference group. So we can impose these structures on the production network, and that can give us additional conditions that can be met in equilibrium, and they would still exist equilibria that would satisfy these constructions. Let's go back to the example. Let's impose that all the positions involved with the production of X form a reference group. Yeah. And that can be called RR sub X, the reference group related to X. And then the single position that is related to the production of Y uh, forms its own um, reference group. And so Clearly, that position has, has more power because uh, it's a singleton uh, reference group. Yeah. And what we can then do is impose that the positions related to the production of X are treated equally. Yeah. And so we impose an, an, an income equality between those. And income equality is equivalent to imposing Leontjev pricing in that reference group but it is subject to market balance. So it's not purely on Jeff pricing. It is Leontjev pricing subject to market balance for X and Y, it's a, uh, uh, but it still works in this particular setting because out of that balancing of the incomes, there come prescriptions of the prices for the intermediary goods. So both intermediary goods, uh, the prices can be described as equations based on the price of Y relative to X, the exchange rate for X and Y essentially. And then you can uh, solve the system again and there would be then a fully specified equilibrium emerging for that depending on the exact demand structure in the economy. So you can, apply this for a wide range of issues. You can explain inequality in the economy with this by putting certain positions in certain reference groups or imposing that certain positions like a, a platform, for example, uh, sits in its own reference group and so can impose its own terms of trade 
to the rest of the of the network, in particular in the in the supply chain that in which that position is sitting. So this can explain why platforms can command much higher uh, return than other positions in more competitive situations. Yeah. Um, and that links then to network theory, namely centrality uh, issues with regard to networks. Yeah. Um, all right. It also leads in a very natural way to debating what is, uh, how do you account for everything? What is the wealth that is generated in such networks? Um, namely, every reference structure leads to a different price system and leads to a different level of GDP, even though from a technical point of view, uh, nothing changed in the economy. It is the same production system, but it can have a wide variety of, of uh, GDP levels that are generated. And it then leads to the question, is there not a smarter way to do this wealth measurement? Yeah. It is not so obvious, by the way, uh, this is an open question because I do not know exactly how to do this either. Yeah. And then there's the issue of unproductive activities versus productive activities and services. What are services? How do you model that here? What is productive? What is unproductive? And these issues um, are, are important. Yeah. All right, I went way over my time, I think, uh, but um, I have integrated here several ideas coming from the economics literature and uh, i hope i i put it in a comprehensive uh, uh, picture in which i can combine that with other questions about egalitarianism about uh, monopoly control uh, you know platform control and and related issues um, and we integrated the of pricing with monopoly pricing and marginalism in one single framework in some sense. Um, on top of that, the architecture of the production network is very important with regard in particular to the issue of uh, supply chain control and an and influence in the production network um, because these reference groups, as I described them, can be based on the architecture in particular. And maybe I should stop here. So if there's any questions. Thank you very much, Professor Giles. Uh, that was very rich and uh, very informative. Now I open the floor up for questions, colleagues, please. Uh, yes, Professor Tober. Uh Thank you, Professor Giles, for giving us a very insightful overview of how this entire cycle performs. So my question comes from the recycle part of the presentation. Uh, very recently, we have noticed that many major corporates around the globe have started discussing about recycling their packaging. For example, Colgate Palmolive very recently uh, introduced a new level of uh, toothpaste packaging. Now, given the fact that obviously we need to wonder about sustainability, we have to be environment friendly, but somewhere or the other, we are also touching upon the economic the chains, chains where uh, the production of uh, the people who supply these tubes is gonna get affected. So how do you think that we can balance uh, the economic cycle in such cases where sustainability and recycle are also getting a lot of importance? At the same time, the other person is also going on business. Yeah, so I mentioned that um, one of the, the features of um, the, the historical development of the social division of labor is that more and more products have been externalized. So more and more products are traded. And so um, uh, nearly everything is now subject to property rights and everything is uh, tradable. There, there are no more free resources. Uh, land is tradable, labor is tradable. Um, 
which were not in the past, of course. Um, now, the latest stage of that can be develop, uh, can be thought of as um, indeed uh, residuals from production. So indeed, uh, um, the recycling of unusable outputs. Um, this will simply mean that in the production network, you have a loop. You, 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 you get uh, looped production networks that um, from, from uh, positions in the network, they emerge uh, streams of uh, intermediary goods. You can call them intermediary goods still, but they are residuals from production processes. Uh, and they go then to other positions that can be uh, recycling uh, firms and they can be used for uh, producing other intermediary goods or they can be uh, turned into energy, things like that. Um, so, um, uh, it, this theory can indeed capture the, the looped, the, 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 the feedback loops, so to say, that, are, that can be described by, by recycling. And as such, you can price uh, these products. You can price these as intermediary goods. Do, do I, did I give an, uh, an answer to your question or do you mean something different? Oh, uh, yes, uh, yes, is precisely what, uh, what I was looking forward to. Many thanks, sir. All right, friends, colleagues, more questions? Yes, Professor Sen. Um, hello, Professor Giles. You know, first of all, thank you so much for um, you know, such a great talk. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I have you know, a couple of questions. So one is a question, question. Another one is, you know, I'll ask you to uh, explain a bit that you have already. Uh, so my question is that uh, uh, so this theory, um, it, it explains, uh, you know, the pricing in terms of a traditional market structure. But if we are uh, thinking about the gig economy, where the very idea of property rights is very different from the traditional market structure, uh, uh, can we apply this uh, theory in a sharing economy type uh, market as well? That is, that's an, an open problem. Um, if, if you're talking about more cooperative elements that are not subject to the property rights and all that. Yes. That, that needs to be fully developed still. I, we were able to do this uh, for the perfectly competitive case. So if you, in this framework that I described, that I summarized essentially before I went to production network uh, networks, in that framework, we can do it. So uh, we have a fully developed uh, pricing theory for collective goods. A very, very broad class of collective goods, which includes uh, any collective um, interaction, actually, um, which is a, a, a valuation equilibrium concept. And um, we get exactly the same results, but more generalized that I summarized. So it's, it's the, the same setting. The whole, what is an open problem still is how to do that in the network theory. So collective activity or collective goods um, or, or group activity in, an, in the production network, that is still an open issue. Uh, thank you, thank you, Professor. So the, um, the, the collective good uh, uh, for the perfectly competitive case was published in uh, Journal of Economic Be uh, Behavior and Organization. And uh, there's also a paper forthcoming in uh, economic theory. Uh, thank you, thank you, Professor. You know that answers uh, my questions. I'll definitely look up those uh, two papers, and you know, once your paper got gets published, this one. So it'll be great if you can share this one with us as well. Uh, uh, so my uh, uh, another question is that you know, towards the end, you have uh, you have mentioned that this model can be used to explain inequality. So uh, it'll be you know, can you can you please you know, explain you know once again so how uh, this can be used to explain inequality? That is based on those reference groups. So if you uh, 
put certain positions in a reference group, then um, they they can they are treated differently from other positions in other reference groups. And uh, you can in particular model the, the power of a singleton reference group and the kind of monopoly power, but it's in the context of a network. So I would not like to call it monopoly. It is, it's a middleman uh, position, for example. Middleman power can be modeled in that way. So if you have a middleman, he can set the terms of trade, which is the intermediary good price itself, and impose that on others. And he can extract as a consequence um, uh, the, all the surpluses from the production network or, or a certain part of the production network and maybe a certain supply chain. Yeah? So the, 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 the concept of these reference groups makes it possible to do that. And you can make, uh, you, you can, can explicitly compute uh, how that is, uh, 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 how that, that can be exercised. Thank you, Professor Jensen. Thanks a lot. So that was uh, my last question. Thanks. More questions, colleagues? Well, Professor Giles, I have a question. Actually, it's more in the nature of a curiosity. My name is Somya Day. Uh, I teach history at uh, uh, JGBS. I teach economic history, actually, which is actually a very Marxian discipline. Uh, yes. But personally, I've, I've uh, moved beyond Marxism. I'm more into the history of ideas and more into cultural history these days. So I saw that you began with the Marxian application of these concepts, labor, commodity, etc. And uh, uh, on the basis of my reading of the Capital, I remember that Marx uh, um, defines labor as these uh, mental and physical attributes, which are, which are applied to produce uh, exchange value. Uh, you, um, beyond the use value of commodities. So I think implicit in this explanation, in this definition of labor is that it is culturally determined, of course. And I would say that labor is the application of certain mental and physical attributes. But now in, in pre-modern societies, what happened was that in certain instances, certain kinds of application of uh, mental and physical attributes was not recognized as labor. It was a gendered process. So for example, when the women applied their labor in the domestic space, it, it was not quite recognized as labor. So I think the Marxian definitions of labor or uh, labor and capital, sorry, labor and commodity as conceptualized by Marx are also inherently unstable. I would say that probably it is not possible to objectively identify labor and capital uh, independent of time and space. So do you suppose that it is, um, it might be possible to objectively identify uh, intermediary goods to uh, independent of time and space because that too is a culturally determined uh, um, artifact, uh, if I might say so. Now, yeah, of course, you're <clears throat> completely right. Uh, we, we cannot do that. But from a theoretical point of view, uh, how do you build a, a theory of, of, uh, of the economy? And what, what the traditional economic theory is static, there is no time. And that's, as soon as you add time, it, it becomes infinitely more complex. And that is exactly what De Bruyne uh, ran into, because he wanted to add time to his framework. And so that is why he invented that contingent commodity concept, um, because then it becomes time dependent, it becomes uh, norm dependent, uh, cultural determined and all that. But you get then infinitely many thin markets, markets without uh, measurable supply and demand. And you know, you, you have a, a bunch of apples sitting in a, on a stand uh, at, the, at the grocery shop and for five minutes, they're not touched. What is happening in those five minutes? It, uh, th those are the issues that he was grappling with. And of course we don't think in those terms, when we talk about history, because we talk about also long periods of time, that we compact uh, and say, oh, this was an era that in which this and this uh, happened. Um, you don't talk about five minutes. But from a theoretical point of view, that is exactly the issue that, that we run into. Um, the, um, uh, of course, what I picked from Marx is just chapter one, essentially. <laughs> And the rest I forgot about. Um, but um, uh, uh, Marx, of course, is a, is a very complex uh, 
um, theorists, I mean, the, the, the richness of his theory is tremendous. And that is what I ran into as well. I, I, uh, when I started to explore this idea of the social division of labor, I ran into all these issues as well. And indeed, um, historically speaking, what you talk about also is the, the externalization of uh, what used to be home produced or, or not priced. It was not, it was not traded through an infrastructure, but was, was done uh, within the home or the household or within uh, the tribe or whatever. Um, and that is culturally determined. And so that is the third element that I listed, namely these institutions. Uh, those are extremely important uh, with regard to this whole theory. Um, now, the, um, this theory, labor does not exist. It is human capital. It is specialized labor. And it is, it's therefore very different from just labor force. And so that is also a major difference uh, from, from Marx, for example, or the classical uh, thinkers. And even Schraffa himself uh, did not put, did not take the next step to that, namely getting away from this idea that there is labor, because that is exactly what happened, of course, uh, when he was developing this theory in, in capitalism itself, namely we got a much more complex world and we, 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 um, we created uh, essentially extremely highly specialized human capital. And this is what is in this theory. Every position represents human capital in some sense. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Charles. You have given me more food for thought. And as about Marx being complex, well, uh, some, somehow I feel that he did not notice his own contradictions, actually. Um, as yeah, that is true. Yeah. With moved beyond Marx. So thank yeah, you but it, that is always with complex theories, you, you, you run into contradictions. That's right. More questions, colleagues? I think we, uh, we have a few more minutes before we conclude. Uh, Professor Antil, might you have something to ask? Professor Ganguly? No, I think Sukanya raised her hand. Uh, yes, yes, uh, Sukanya, you're? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you, Sukanya. Yes, uh, great. Um, uh, hello, Professor, this is Sukanya. I'm a lecturer in economics uh, at uh, JGBS. So I uh, had a um, clarificatory question. So when, when we construct our general equilibrium models, we mostly assume that um, uh, the market is not segmented, right? So let's say in, in a situation like India, we have market segmentations. Let's say in case of uh, labor market, we have the formal economy and the informal economy. Right? So certain workers work in the formal sector, certain workers work in the informal sector. So how, how would you model an economy in which, um, say, the informal output becomes an intermediary for the formal sector? Let me give you an example. So uh, where if I say, um, say Uber is a service, so that, that comes under the formal sector, and say the drivers who get employed in the Uber, or say uh, the delivery boys who serve uh, say the swiggy delivery that we have here. So these are informal uh, workers. So if I have certain informal commodities, how would that be uh, structured here? Um, I, can you clarify the idea of informal versus formal? Okay, okay. So uh, the way I- Because uh, Uber, you mean, you, Uber does not have an, a labor contract in the classical sense with their drivers. Is, is exactly, that what you exactly. mean with formal exactly, versus exactly. informal? Yes, but yes. You, the, the, uh, for economics, it doesn't matter because I have a static model and in the static model, there's no time and therefore it's the same. There's no, the, the difference between formal and informal is, um, is not relevant. It is only relevant when there's time. And so that's, that's the first thing I want to say. And the second thing is that um, if there are differences, 
you, in economics, you just say these are different commodities and they're treated completely differently and they're priced completely differently and they are subject to different demand and supply forces. So those are uh, two elements that to take into account when, when we talk about those, those things. So only in a, in a world with time uh, does this uh, distinction between formal and informal make sense. And um, secondly, if you distinguish it, then you have to introduce different commodities to describe them. Uh, of course, they're related to each other, uh, but you need to introduce then the properties that make that relationship clear. So for example, they are exchangeable, they're substitutes. That is one, one possible way to, to introduce that. Oh, yes, clarifies. So, so basically, we consider that as uh, two different commodities and then model it thereafter. Yeah. Yeah. It, it has to come through the properties of the commodities that you attribute to the commodities. Yeah. Okay, I understand. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Uh, any more questions, colleagues? Well, uh, if there are none, I suppose we might conclude this uh, uh, talk by Professor Robert Giles. Thank you very much, Professor Giles. That was, uh, that was a great talk, very insightful, conceptually rich, and it got all of us thinking. And uh, thank you very much, colleagues, for these questions that you asked and uh, for enriching this discussion, making it uh, such a rich, rich conversation between you and Professor Giles. The next CREE talk is scheduled for the 16th of March at 6.30 p.m. And uh, the speaker for the day would be uh, Professor Sushant Malik, who teaches uh, international finance at the University of London. Please do participate. See you then. And uh, thank you. Th uh, thank you very much again, Professor Giles and uh, colleagues. All right. Thank you for having me.